And when we ended last week, I had just read the letter that Jesus told John to write to the angel of the church in Pergamum. And that city is located about 70 miles north of Smyrna and about 15 miles inland. And Pergamum, it was a center for the worship of the most important pagan gods, Zeus, Athena, Dionysus, Asclepius. And it was the capital city of the province of Asia. And it was the official center in Asia of the imperial cult. When I say imperial cult, I mean the worship of the emperor. So it was, the, it was the center of that. In fact, it was the first city in, in the province of Asia to receive permission to build a temple that was dedicated to the worship of a living ruler. That was way back in 29 BC when Augustus granted the city the permission to build a temple that it was to be built in Pergamum there to the divine Augustus and the goddess Roma. So the goddess of Rome. Now the title Jesus is described here is the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. And this is a reminder to this threatened congregation that although the Roman proconsul in that capital city, he had the power to execute people at will. And though that's true, this is a reminder that the ultimate power over life and death belongs to God and his Christ. He is the true judge. However it looks here, this person has the power to execute at will. The true judge is the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus assures them, he knows that they live where Satan has his throne. So he he knows, he, he reassures them that. And this probably refers to this idea about where Satan has his throne that probably refers to the fact that Pergamum, as I said, that was the official center in the province of emperor worship. And that would make it a hotbed for Christian persecution, that it was the very, the official center for emperor worship. Well, you can see what's going to flow out of that in terms of Christians who refuse to do that. So as Grant Osborne in his commentary, he explains, he says, the best option for what is meant by Satan's throne is the imperial cult. The major problem behind Revelation as a whole and the core of Pergamum religion. It was emperor worship that most directly occasioned the persecutions under Domitian and Trajan and Pergamum was the center of the imperial cult for all the province of Asia. As Alm, that's David Alm, says, it is not so much an architectural or local feature. In other words, there are some people who say, well, the Satan's throne refers to some particular monument or something in Pergamum. And there are a number of candidates where you could think that. But he says, Alm says, it's not so much an architectural or local feature that is in mind, but rather Roman opposition and persecution of Christians that is central. That's where Satan has his throne That's what he's talking about. And despite the difficulty this created of living in that city, that because it was the center of the imperial cult, had such a, it was such a difficult time for Christians, they had remained faithful to his name despite living there, living in that environment. These Christians had remained loyal and faithful to Jesus Christ, even when the persecution had become so intense that one of them, a man named Antipas, was put to death. Well, they didn't renounce their faith even then. So when they saw that one of them had been killed, well, you can see the tendency to cut and run and to scatter when you see that, well, it's gotten to this point now that they're killing us. But he says that even then they did not renounce their faith. And the phrase where he says, where Satan lives, he says, my faithful witness who was killed among you where Satan dwells, It reveals, right, that the hostility that is being manifested against these Christians, though it comes in political form, it comes uh, with governmental power and might, the ultimate force behind it is Satan. You see, he's what's animating this political force and this hostility and this opposition. He's the one who's driving it. And then they're criticized 
for tolerating in their midst. So he has these things that he says about them that they have remained faithful. They remained faithful even when one of them was put to death. They've held to his name. They've continued in steadfast loyalty to him. But they're criticized for tolerating in their midst some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which teaching is analogous to the teaching of Balaam. Okay, you recall in in Numbers chapter 25, verses 1 to 9, you read that with Numbers 31, verse 16, and you see that Balaam, he was the mastermind behind luring Israel away from God and into idolatry and sexual immorality at Peor. So Balaam was the mastermind of that, luring Israel into idolatry and sexual immorality. So that's that's who he is, and these people have figuratively grabbed hold of the teaching of Balaam when they grabbed hold of the analogous teaching of the Nicolaitans. Analogous in the sense that as Balaam has his teaching had pulled people into idolatry and sexual immorality, so the teaching of the Nicolaitans was pulling people into idolatry and sexual immorality. So like Balaam, it seems that the Nicolaitans, they had rationalized or justified in some way participating in idol feasts and in in the accompanying sexual immorality, events which under this emperor Domitian would have included emperor worship as a sign of patriotism and loyalty. So you not only have all of the normal gods that are being worshipped, Now we've added on to that this sense that worshiping these gods and worshiping the emperor now get packaged in the society and culture as also signs of patriotism and loyalty. So it heightens the pressure for me to go along with this. Because if I don't, I'm seen as somebody who's opposed to Roman rule, opposed to the empire, who's an enemy of the society in addition to not going along with ancient cultural norms. Okay, so this, there's a, an awful lot of weight here. So there's great pressure on them to compromise their faith in living in a city that is a center of pagan uh, worship, including the, the imperial cult. Now, whereas the church in Ephesus, you remember, it was praised for not tolerating Right? It was praised for not tolerating, indeed, for hating the works of the Nicolaitans. The church, the church in Pergamum, it's endangered by allowing these heretics into their midst, by accepting them, by tolerating them, allowing them to remain there. In doing that, they would be harboring a spiritual cancer that would wreak havoc if not excised. It would influence the saints toward the evil of idolatry and sexual immorality because I'm tolerating this in my midst. I'm saying it's okay, it's acceptable. Well, when you do that, it's going to spread, it's going to metastasize, and it's going to harm many people. So the command for them is to repent. He tells this church that they must cease, they must stop accepting in their fellowship those who promote and engage in such works, those who promote idol worship and its accompanying sexual immorality. It is not spiritual. If there's one word that needs to be said in our culture, it is not spiritual to be tolerant of wickedness. Okay, it's not spiritual to do that. It is disobedient, it is ungodly, it is unloving, and it is damaging to the body of Christ. That's why Paul, in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, he rebuked the church in Corinth. He rebuked them for tolerating a sexually immoral man in their midst. They were doing that, and he demanded that they disfellowship him. You see, Christ forgives without limit, but he always demands repentance. 
You just can't have people thumbing their nose at God and be saying, that's, oh, yeah, we're fine with that. In fact, we're proud of how tolerant we are of it. It shows how enlightened we are. And I'm just saying to you, that's false. Okay? That's just a lie. And you see it right here. Now, if the church doesn't repent of tolerating this sin, he says he will come to them soon, meaning he will come to them in judgment, presumably by removing the church's lampstand, as he had said in chapter 2, verse 5, and he will war against the proponents and practitioners of the Nicolaitan heresy with the sword of his mouth. In other words, his word, which is the basis of judgment, that standard, it will be given effect in his warring against them, which I suspect means that he will inflict illness, suffering, and even death on them, as we will see in verses 21 to 23. Now, if you think, you say, well, that seems really wild that he would do that. Well, isn't that what happened with Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5? Doesn't the Lord speak of having disciplined those in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 27 to 30? That's why some of you are ill and some have fallen asleep because they were corrupting the Lord's Supper. Okay, so it's not at all out of the, out of, uh, or, or just so extremely unusual. You can't think that's the right way to see it. I think it is the right way to see it that that's what he's talking about. Then he says, those who overcome, you see, those who conquer, those who resist the pressure and the lure of the Nicolaitans, or those who repent of having fallen prey to that pressure and lure, they'll be given, he says, hidden manna. Now, I think manna, it represents God's miraculous provision for his people, which is what it meant during the, the wilderness experience in Exodus, right? It's God's miraculous provision for his people. And here it stands for all that God will provide his people in the eternal state. All that he's going to provide them. And those blessings, currently they're unseen. Currently, all that is in store for those in the eternal state, it's hidden in heaven. It's awaiting disclosure in the consummated kingdom at Christ's return. Then we will see and experience all that he intends for us. And so that's what I think that this blessing, this miraculous provision for his people that is now hidden. And those who overcome also will be given a white stone, he says that is inscribed with a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Now, this is not clear. What is he talking about here? The background of this white stone may be the practice of ancient jurors that they would place in an urn when they were giving their vote for conviction or acquittal. If they were voting to acquit, they would place in the urn a white stone. So it may be, that may be the background of it. Or it could be that a stone, this white stone was given to the victors of certain games and then they had that stone to use as, a, as an admission ticket for a feast. But either one of those backgrounds would symbolize that the white stone that is given, it stands for a blessing from God. So they will be given that. Then a new name that is inscribed that only they know well, that could be indicating a special nature or status of the Christian's relationship with God in eternity, that they have somehow this unique relationship that will be ours with God forever, okay? That's my best thinking on that. Because, see, a lot of these, these things, as we move away from the people to whom it was first written, these things are understandable to them. But you see, as we get further and further away, sometimes things become cloudy, <laughs> You're trying to say, what exactly is, is this saying? And so that's my best take on that. And then he says, he who has ears to hear uh, what the Spirit says. He who has ears, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then in 2.18 to 29, it says, And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, The words of the Son of God, 
who has eyes like a flame of fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. I know your works, your love and faith and service and patient endurance, and that your latter works exceed the first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess and is teaching and seducing my servants to practice sexual immorality and to eat food sacrificed to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she refuses to repent of her sexual immorality. Behold, I will throw her onto a sickbed, and those who commit adultery with her I will throw into great tribulation unless they repent of her works, and I will strike her children dead. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches mind and heart, and I will give to each of you according to your works. But to the rest of you in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not learned what some call the deep things of Satan. To you, I say, I do not lay on you any other burden. Only hold fast what you have until I come. The one who conquers and who keeps my works until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron as when earthen pots are broken in pieces, even as I myself have received authority from my Father." and I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches." Now Thyatira is about 40 miles southeast of per Pergamum on the road that leads to Sardis. And politically, culturally, and religiously, it was the least significant of the seven cities to which Revelation is sent, but it receives the longest of the seven letters. It was a commercial city. It had in it a large number of trade guilds, or what we might call unions. You have inscriptions found there uh, that mention wool workers, linen workers, makers of outer garments, dyers, leather workers, tanners, potters, bakers, slave dealers, and bronze smiths. And you recall in Acts chapter 16, Lydia, she's a dealer in purple cloth, and she is from the city of Thyatira. And every craftsman and trader naturally belonged to the appropriate trade guild. That was part of how you were doing business. They naturally belonged to that. And ancient trade guilds, they were very much tied up with religious observances. It wasn't like, oh, we've got this secular union. That's not how it was. They were all part of these trade guilds, and these trade guilds were intimately associated with religious observances. Each of the guilds had, had its own patron deity. Like, you know how people have patron saints? Roman Catholics, this saint is for this and this saint is for that. Well, they had patron deities that took a special liking to their particular occupation and had a special blessing. So they each had these local patron deities and the meetings of these societies. When they would gather, they included a meal that was dedicated to a pagan god and it frequently included sexual immorality. And the primary god worshipped in Thyatira was Apollo, who's the sun god and the son of the god Zeus. So that's who that is. Now, Jesus is described as the son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. And this is the only place in Revelation where the title son of God is used, and it's probably used here as a reminder to them that it is Jesus and not Apollo who is the true Son of God. You see, we've got Apollo, the son of Zeus, and he's big time there. He's the son of the God. You see, Jesus uses that there. His eyes of blazing fire see through the seductive arguments of Jezebel as she's spinning these arguments and pulling people into her heresy, into her sin. 
sees right through that, and he's powerful in his opposition to it. So these, these, the picture of Christ that was painted initially, different elements of that are drawn in the specific letters to the churches for reasons. And that's what I think is going on there. And then Jesus assures them he knows their good works or deeds, which he specifies as their love, their faith, their service, their perseverance. As Grant Osborne says in his commentary, these four describe a life of Christian caring for others and faithfulness to God. And he also knows that unlike the church in Ephesus, unlike that church that had forsaken its first love, well, they're now doing more than they did at first, right? He says, I know that your latter works exceed the first. So there are a lot of things that going on that are right here. There were some, the church in Thyatira had some important things right. Okay? We have to see that. But whereas the church in Ephesus was praised, it was praised for hating the practices of the Nicolaitans, for not tolerating those things, for refusing to allow them. They were praised for that. The church in Thyatira is criticized for tolerating a woman who is referred to as Jezebel. See, who calls herself a prophetess. So here's this woman in this community who claims to be a spokesman for God, claims to be a prophetess, but here in Scripture she's labeled Jezebel. Okay, Jezebel, of course, was the wicked Phoenician wife of the Israelite king Ahab who promoted in Israel the worship of the Canaanite god Baal which worship included sexual immorality. See, so why is this prophetess who is saying falsely that she's speaking for God when pulling these people into idolatry and sexual immorality, why is she called Jezebel? Because it's very fitting. Because <laughs> that's who Jezebel was. So she's labeled Jezebel. She's saying these things, persuading these people in the church to do that. So, so she's claimed, like Jezebel, this, this woman in Thyatira who claims to be speaking for God, she's teaching the people there, teaching the Christians, claiming this is coming from God, that it's okay for Christians to participate in idol feasts and to accept sexual immorality. Now, she most likely, she is the local voice of the Nicolaitan heresy, the Nicolaitan movement, which we see in verses 14 and 15, and in church history, that Nicolaitan movement involved the same practices of idolatry and sexual immorality. So what she has done, she has offered a compromise, claiming to speak for God. You have this tremendous social pressure that I want to be able to participate in these trade deals. I don't want to be an outcast. I don't want to carry the burden of being a Christian in a society that hates Christians. So she's giving them a way out, a way to compromise. She's saying, God is saying to you through me that it's really okay to participate in the idol feast and with their associated sexual immorality. So she's doing that to them. And so, that, see, that would allow them See, to participate in the economically important trade guilds. So, I, I, you know how it is. I have ears for that, baby. I don't want to hear this. I'm very resistant to the teaching that says, no, you have to stand. You can't do that. Whatever it costs you, you must stand faithful to Christ. Were you telling me there's somebody over here saying God says... It's really okay for me to participate in these things? And if, I, if, if that's the truth, well, we, oh yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> right? Isn't that how it works? I think that's true. You know, and so that's, what, that's what's going on there. And uh, it's just because how important it is for them socially, they have ears for that. And she's actually pulling some of the people in. She was persuading a segment of the church, pulling them into sin. 
That's what's going on. Now, one is reminded here of the claim by some in Corinth. You say, well, how is that possible? How could anyone possibly sell that to anybody? Well, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we see that there are people there making the claim that, listen, uh, they're saying that it's really okay to go and participate in the idol feasts in the pagan temples, and their argument is that, look, as Christians, we know there's only one God, right? So therefore, we know that these so-called gods in these pagan temples, they're not in fact gods. And since we know that they're not in fact gods, eating a ritual meal in a pagan temple, we really understand that it's not an act of worship, but it's purely a social matter. So it's really okay, despite what Paul has been telling you, it's really okay. Paul spends chapters 8, 9, and 10 of 1 Corinthians explaining why that is false. Okay, but the point is that false teachers were working overtime. They were working overtime there in Corinth to justify participating in idolatry. The reason is that it was so socially important. You and I think of it as some kind of isolated thing. It was, it was just... Uh, integral to life in the ancient world. And so there was a great cost in abandoning that socially. And so everybody was itching for something that would allow them to do it, and the answer from God regularly is, no, no, no. Stand firm, pay whatever the price is. You can't, uh, you know, try to convince yourself this. Now, Christ probably through his spokesman he had urged her to repent. You see, it says, I gave her time to repent. Whether he sent prophets there, real prophets, or whether it was teachers who understood the truth of God who were rebuking her and telling her to repent, Christ through them had given her time to repent, but she was unwilling to heed his word. And he now promises to inflict her with illness, and he also threatens her followers with suffering and death, unless they repent. And again, Ananias and Sapphira and the discipline that was meted out on the church in Corinth. And the result of this, it's going to be to reinforce for the churches the fact that the Lord knows all things and he cannot be mocked and that he punishes impenitence and rewards faithfulness. Now, this statement here, he says, give to each according to your work. People see that and they go, what's that about? And here's what Ian Paul says in his commentary. He says, rewarding people according to their deeds is not about some kind of salvation by works, but in line with all other teaching in the New Testament. The conviction that the grace of God in Jesus affects the transformation of a person's life. And so true faith in Jesus manifests in the kinds of qualities and actions that the Thyatirans are commended for at the start of the message. Okay, you understand that. That genuine, saving, biblical faith is not merely a matter of abstract knowledge, that I simply know certain things are true. It is a surrender to those things. It is a conviction and a turning of the entire person and being, mind, body, spirit. So I cannot be a believer in these things and not have that genuine belief manifest in my life. If it doesn't manifest in my life, it is what James calls merely a dead faith. It is simply a sterile knowing. But that is never what the Bible means when it speaks of biblical faith. Okay, so that's, that's what he's, he's talking about there, and I think Ian Paul expresses that well. Now, Jesus then, he refers to those who do not hold to Jezebel's teachings as those who have not known, meaning they had not accepted what some call the deep things of Satan. Now, Jezebel's group, her little entourage there, the Nicolaitans, they probably considered their false teaching that Christians can engage in idolatry, can participate in idolatry. They probably thought that was spiritual insight. You see, they thought it was deep. That's how I, I say many times, false teachers never come and say, uh, by the way, I don't know a thing, 
and uh, you know, what I'm telling you is trash. I'm presenting heresy to you. They never say that. They always come and say, I have new, deeper insight. Okay? And so what's going on, I suspect, is that the Nicolaitans are presenting this false teaching here as spiritual insight, that it's okay to participate in idolatry. That's really spiritual insight, and they're presenting it to the people as the deep things of God. But some of the faithful Christians rejected that characterization, and they rightly described it. It's deep things, all right, but it's the deep things of Satan. You see, that, that's what you're selling us here. We're not that stupid. You see, when you're calling us to participate in idol worship and to engage in sexual immorality, we are aware enough to know that what you're really selling, you're calling it deep things of God, deep things indeed but it's the deep things of Satan. I think that's what's going on there. Now, he lays no burden on these faithful saints other than the requirement that they hold to the truth they have until he comes. Those who conquer, those who overcome, and who do his will to the end, they will share with Christ in his final victory over his and their opponents which is, des- which is described from Psalm 2, this victory of him over his and their opponents is described from Psalm 2 as bre- the breaking of them to pieces. It's a rule expressed. The Lord's rule is expressed in the ultimate defeat and punishment of his enemies. You see that, for example, in chapter 19, verse 15. And Christians, in some sense, because of our identification with Jesus, we will share in that victory. We will, in some sense, participate in that rule, in that breaking of these enemies of Jesus and us. We're going to share in that. Leon Morris, in his commentary, says, this seems to show that the overcomer will have a place in the final decisive victory of Christ over the world forces opposed to God. So in some sense, through our unity and identification with Jesus through faith, as he executes his victory, that we share in that, in the execution of his victory over his enemies. And those who overcome and do his will, they also, he says, will be given the morning star they'll be given the morning star. Now, Jesus is called the bright morning star in chapter 22, verse 16. And I think the idea here, this is somewhat obscure, but I think the idea here is the same one that Peter expresses in in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 19. He says there, and we have the holy, reliable prophetic word to which you do well in paying attention as to light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Okay? The day of which Peter is speaking is the day of Christ's consummating return. It is the parousia. It is the second coming of Christ. And at that time, When Jesus returns, the morning star, Jesus Christ, will rise in the hearts of the faithful in that that their gratitude for and their appreciation of him will become even greater, even greater as their faith becomes sight. You see, it'll be something like they will in the vernacular be busting. At that time, at Christ's return, we love and we're devoted to him. But even there, it's going to be a transforming thing for us that our love and devotion, our appreciation of it is even going to be more elevated. That that morning star will rise in our hearts figuratively in that at that time, on that day, we will be busting in a sense that we're not presently doing. So the faithful will be given the morning star, I think, in the sense they will be given Christ 
in a new way. They will be given a new experience of his glory that will happen, as Peter says, on that day at the parousia. All right, that's what I think he's talking about. And he says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And we can't allow our desire to get along, our desire to fit into the, uh, to the economy. We can't allow our desire for safety to cause us to compromise our undivided allegiance to Christ. Now, that's a message that needs to be said in this society. Okay, uh, I, don't know, I don't know how tuned in you are how much you pay attention to, how you read the tea leaves. But it's getting dark, okay? Things to me, you know, a, a darkness is falling. And what is in store, I do not know. Uh, ultimately, I know. But uh, this is a message that we need to hear and take to heart, that we hold to Jesus Christ like a mad dog. Okay, that's it. Now, he says to the church, to the angel of the church, in Sardis, right? The words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Yet you have, you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. The one who conquers will be clothed thus in white garments, and I will never blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So Sardis, it's located on a mountain on the edge of the Hermas River Valley. It's about 40 miles southeast of Thyatira and about 45 miles east of Smyrna. And some 600 years earlier, it had been a very powerful city uh, in the ancient world, but it had long been in decline in terms of its political importance. So it at one time in the distant past had been very powerful, but those days had gone. And in A.D. 17, okay, so we're right here, Revelation 95, 96, right around there. A.D. 17, so a good number of years before, Sardis was severely damaged in an earthquake. And it was rebuilt with considerable financial assistance from the Roman emperor Tiberius. So you can see that makes the city really grateful and beholden, right, to the Roman authorities. It was rebuilt that way, and it was an active commercial city, and it was very wealthy. It was a center for woolen goods. It claimed to be the first to discover the art of dyeing wool, and it was where gold and silver coins were first made. And the estimated population of the city in the first century is around 120,000 people. Okay, so these are, these are significant uh, cities. And so they, they are, uh, you know, cities of, of size that you may not think. As you, you just think, well, it's just a small little place, but that's not so. All right, so Jesus is described here as the one who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. And this suggests that See, that in and through Christ, in and through him, they have available the power of the Holy Spirit, and that he is the Lord and the protector of the churches. This nearly dead church, this nearly dead church needed to know that the Lord who calls them to revival, he's calling them, well, he makes available the power to achieve that revival. Okay, the power of the Spirit. And so he's calling them to this revival, and he assures them that he knows their works. But here there's nothing to commend. In the other churches we've seen that he, he knows their works, and he says things that are meant to reassure and comfort them, that he knows the good things that they do. Here there's nothing to commend. 
So his knowing of their works here doesn't function that way, right? Here it's the basis for his criticism what he knows about them. It's the basis of criticism. They had a reputation for being alive, but the fact of the matter is they were spiritually dead. So the reality is they were dead, and yet people continued to see them as being spiritually alive. And this death was demonstrated by the incompleteness or the unsatisfactory nature of their works. And that's what I tell you. Faith and action go together. They're just different ends of the same stick. If I'm not living and doing anything, it's just a sign that my faith is dead. Right? I've drifted into a dead faith. If I have true faith, genuine, it cannot help but manifest in my life. And we see that everywhere, right? If I truly believe something, well, I'm going to act according to that. If I truly believe that Christ died for me, that he's the Son of God, Lord of all, he saved me, rescued me, has given me a pathway or uh, uh, entry into heaven, spend eternity there, and the one who rescued me calls me to live a certain way, if I believe all those things, well, it's going to manifest, right? I'm going to be out there trying to live. I'm not simply going to go, Pfft. I appreciate that work you did, but by the way, I want to live the way I want to live. And whenever anything you say contradicts how I want to live, I'm just going to, Pfft. and I'm going to be king. I'm going to be on the throne. Well, to say that is to say I don't believe. You see? These things simply go together like that. So he tells them that, look, that they, they don't have anything there to commend, and it's there demonstrated by their lack of works and effort, and the works praised by Christ in chapter 2, verse 19, with regard to Thyatira. There, their love, faith, service, and perseverance. And just as Sardis had declined, I heard that bell, had declined politically over the centuries, right? They had been one time been great, now they're really insignificant politically. This is what has happened to them spiritually. They have now declined and tracked their political fall. They've now, they're dead, but they have this reputation for being alive. Next week, Lord willing, thanks.